and we're going to clean it. Amen. And you know how hard it is to get folk to throw something away? Y'all did it. So I'm so proud of us today. We threw stuff away this week. Amen. So I know some of you don't walk through the other side of the church, but it is amazingly cleared out. And we are here now to clear out not just the building, but clear our hearts and our minds. And prepare to enter an abortion today. On this first Sunday, as we're going to talk about communion and what it means and all those other cool things. So I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet. Slide in. Of my heart be accepted by thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. O 
Give it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, y'all. Y'all excited to be here today? I'm excited to be here today. Amen. It's a good day outside. It's a little cloudy, but it ain't raining. Amen. So your hair is all right. You made it in the building. You're looking good. You're looking cute. Today we're going to talk about communion. Communion is going to be the whole sermon today. We're going to let this awesome praise team get up in here and do what they do. And uh, get ready to praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.
sometimes we just kind of do stuff out of habit, out of tradition. So I thought it might be interesting for the month of May to go into a little bit about communion. What does this mean? What does what's all this juice and cracker stuff mean? Talk about baptism. In this little pool, why do some people got a whole bathtub and we got a little Tupperware bowl? Amen. So what's the difference, right? Then we're going to talk about the Bible. Why are there so many versions of the Bible? The international version, King James version, contemporary English version, NRSV. What's the Apocrypha? Some come with an Apocrypha. Some come without an Apocrypha. What are all the things in the back? The commentary, the dictionary, the maps and all that. What's important? What should I look for? If you ever want to buy a Bible, it's not like you just walk in and buy one book, right? Like they got a whole bunch of bells and whistles. So we're going to talk about that towards the end of the month. And then prayer which we're going to talk about on uh, Mother's Day. I thought it would be appropriate to lay the prayer Mother's Day lesson together because the song that says, somebody pray for me. And we all took the time. So that's where we're going this month, y'all. So if you know somebody that's got these questions, bring them. If you got my number on my Facebook, feel free to inbox me your questions and we're just going to try to hang out a little bit. Sometimes you got to shout, holler, and inspire people, but sometimes you got to inform people. So that's what this is going to be. This is going to be informed. So, what is this thing called Holy Communion? Uh, sometimes it's called the Eucharist. Uh, sometimes it's called the Mass. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the names I've heard for Holy Communion. In the AME Church and in the Methodist Church, we have two sacraments. We have baptism and we have communion. And by sacrament, I mean those things that we consider non-negotiable and sacred. Okay? When we talk about communion, I'm going to kind of talk about past, and then maybe present, and then kind of forward what it all means. So the first thing is where does it come from? The day before Jesus gets crucified, he heads to Jerusalem. Is everything okay? I'm a little later. Y'all saw what happened to the church next door, right? So I mean, we had a lot of water this week, so. He heads to Jerusalem. And he sits and he has supper with his friends, the disciples. And we already know that one of them is going to betray him, which is really bold to like sit and eat with somebody that you already know is stabbing you in the back, right? And he sits there and they have this meal and he begins to tell them that they ought to continue to have this meal even without him. And the meal and the festival that they gathered for was the Passover, the Jewish festival of the Passover, or sometimes called the Seder, S-E-D-E-R. And what the Seder is, if we go back another step, is it is a celebration of God delivering them from bondage in Egypt. Right? We all know the story. Moses goes up to Pharaoh. Moses tells Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh tells Moses, you tripping, you got me twisted. And then Moses goes, all right, I got somebody for you. And then they come back and frogs come and locusts come and the river turns red. And finally he ends up on the last of the plagues, loses his son. And they put blood across the top of the door to let the spirit know that that house belongs to God. And it moves through and it kills all the firstborn sons. Y'all know this story, right? And then Pharaoh is upset because now he's lost his son. He concedes. He says, you guys can leave. And everybody grabs their stuff, their gold, their items, and everything. And they rush out. And then Pharaoh changes his mind after they leave and says, wait a minute. The factory is empty. All the slaves that left, what are we going to do? We're going to chase them down and they run to the Red Sea. Y'all know that story, right here. Good. So the reason we have this bread and this wine the bread, y'all know this little flat cracker, y'all got that little flat cracker in here? It's called unleavened bread. And that's why it's a cracker and not like a real piece of bread. And the reason it's unleavened bread is because they had to leave Egypt so fast that they were not allowed time for the yeast to settle in for the bread to rise. Come on, where are my home bakers at? Amen. You put the yeast in the bread or in the pizza crust or whatever. You let it sit for a little while. Where my little cook? Am I telling it right, young cook? What's his name? I forgot his name. Am I telling it right? How long the yeast got to be in the bread? That's my little young cook. That's my little culinary guy coming up. So they had to leave so fast that they couldn't wait for the bread to rise up. So that's why they celebrated by eating this flat unleavened bread. To remind them of the time that God delivered them from Egypt and they had to get out the house so fast that they couldn't wait for the bread. Does that make sense? So Jesus comes to Jerusalem.
to celebrate this Passover celebration to remind them that God had delivered them from some things in the past. And they're expected to continue this Jewish tradition on and on and on and on. And Jesus gets them together in that room. Now, I can stop right there. Because I can say every time you eat this cracker, it's supposed to remind you of something that God has delivered you from in the past. Now, you might not have been a slave in Egypt, but we've all been slaves to some stuff. Fell in love with the wrong person. Only three people said amen. Okay. Still in love with the wrong person. <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> right? God delivered you. Some of us have been in financial slavery. Didn't know how to go pay student loans or bills or debts, and God delivered us. Some of us have been in health slavery. Was sick, was down, didn't know how this was going to turn out. Didn't know what, and now they just don't know if I can afford the medicine, even if there is a cure. I need five in hands right there because pharmacology is killing us. So every time they take this Passover, in the Jewish tradition, they will remember that God had delivered them. And Jesus comes with his Jewish friends, and they gather for the Passover. Now, a side note, I need you to know, you don't have the same religion as Jesus. You have a religion that's of Jesus. Jesus was a Jew. We're not Jews. So we don't have the same religion as Jesus. So what they were doing was their religious custom of gathering as Jews. Is this, does the bread make a sense? All right, good. And he gets them together, and he tells them, I'm breaking this bread, drinking this wine, and doing it as often as you shall do it. And always remember me. So to remember me means that this is a commemorative expression. We come to commemorate what God has done for us. We come to remember how God has delivered us. We come to thank God for the fact that we made it. And if you ask some people, they find a sense of victory making it to the communion table one more time. Because let's be honest, you never know when you're going to eat your last communion wafer. And you never know when you're going to drink your last communion cup. So every time you come here, you say thank you. Now, how do I know it's thank you? The scripture I read from Paul says, and he took the bread and he gave thanks. And you know what that Greek word is? My Greek is terrible. But you know what that Greek word is? Eucharisto. He gave Eucharisto, which means thanks, which is why you hear it called Holy Eucharist. Yes, Holy Thank You. Holy Thank You. Now, in our church, you don't have to be a member to come to this table. Okay? And this is kind of where we move from what does it mean in the past to what, it, what does it mean in the present. Because not only is it commemorative, but it's also the place where we expect to meet God in today. And the reason we meet God here today is because this is the table that ideally all the believers in God are going to gather at this table. How many of y'all know black folk like to eat? Uh, I see, I, look, I, I've been knowing y'all eight years now, amen. Y'all don't act like we don't like to eat. We like to eat. And I won't even say black folk because Italian folk, Greek folk, all the people around the world. It's, 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 it's a social thing, right? We gather to eat. We gather together. And so it's so fitting that Jesus' last moments with his friends was like, hey, let's go down to Buffalo Wild Wings. I only got one more day left, right? Right? We're going to hang out. We're going to have this meal. And we're going to get together. But the catch is... Because this is God's invitation to God's people. We, as Methodists, believe that this table is open to everyone. There is no prerequisite to come to this table. I'll even go super radical, and I'm going to hang out here for a second. Because depending on the church you go to, some will require you to have catechism. Some will require you to have baptism, if more if you're Catholic. Some will require you to go through certain things in order to come and be at the communion table. You hear me so far? Yeah. And I need you to understand that in our church, you don't have to be a member. You can be a friend. You can be a visitor. Now, I'm going to really get radical on you on this one. You don't even have to believe in God to come take communion. Yeah, let, me, let that sink in for you. Because what we believe is that we meet God at the communion table. And so you might not know God, but through the expression of communion, come to a place where you want to seek a, a deeper relationship with God 
as a result of the experience. Y'all hear me? I know that's a little radical for some people because we just, you know, we want to have our VIP clubs, right? God has no VIP club at the, at the community table. Everybody can come, anybody can come, and this is an expression of God's love for all of us. And when we get here and we all gather, then we expect this to be the place where we meet each other. And because we're also meeting each other, we're also meeting God at this place. Is this making sense so far? Alright. Alright, clearing up all the bad theology and all the mistakes today. We'll shout in June, I promise. Ain't you all right? Say yeah. But not in May. But lastly, if we go back to the scripture now, I want you to see at the very end, I'm going to skip the very end and go to 27. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body of the Lord. And themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. This is what he says. This is my terms. Don't bring dirty hands to the dinner table. If you're mad at somebody, you're not supposed to bring that to communion. Yes, if you can't say, I love everybody and mean it, because we can all say it, then you're supposed to go get right with that person first, then come back to the communion table. And I'm saying this because I think it adds a sense of gravity to what this really means. That God is saying, we can't all come together and have a family meal and you and your sister don't talk. Y'all, you know, we can't have Thanksgiving dinner at my house until you two straighten it out because it ain't going to be right. Y'all act like y'all don't have families. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So God is saying the same thing. He said, how can we all be part of God's family and then I'm going to have a meal at my house and then you're going to show up to eat, but you ain't even talking to your own cousins and brothers that's in the same family. Amen. So we're expected, not because we're weak, not because you're a punk, but because you're bigger. You're expected to go out and amend whatever it is. I can't control how people respond to me. If Darren McCullough want to be mad at me, he can be mad at me because that's his choice. But if I extend an olive branch and say to Darrell, man, I'm sorry, and he doesn't accept it, it ain't on me no more. Are y'all hearing me? He has to be willing to accept that. Now, little side note. Saying I'm sorry doesn't mean I'm admitting I'm wrong. Sometimes I'm sorry means I value this relationship more than the petty argument that stands between us. So we can agree or disagree, we can whatever, but see, we get this notion that when we're Christians and we're saying, I'm sorry, it just makes us passive and weak and everybody can run. That's not what that means. That means we value each other and we value relationships. So Daryl thought that I should go left and I thought I should go right. We argued and argued and argued and finally it got so bad, I said, Daryl, I'm sorry. Not because I still think I should go his direction, but I'm sorry because I don't want this relationship to become something bigger than what, the, the problem become bigger than what it is. Amen. So Paul says, go fix it with Dale. Yeah. I can't control what Dale does before I come here. Because God don't want you to bring your garbage to his table. Yeah. Go wash your hands when you come in from outside. That's what my mom would say. You're bringing them dirty hands to the table. What's wrong with you? Right? Then, he says, I'm almost done. And we're going to walk through the liturgy. That's the other part of it. Verse 26. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, tradition put this on first Sundays. It doesn't have to be on first Sundays. Tradition put this on once a month. It doesn't have to be once a month. There was a push. Some, I want to say it did over a thousand years ago. There was a push for it to be every week. And in some churches, they still push and do every week, depending on where you go. And there was this big push that 
it should be more often. And then they came out with this thing that you should do it at least once a year. And I'm talking about like World Council of Churches, all the Christians kind of get together, like, what are we going to do with this thing? You know, and I need you to understand from a biblical perspective, it does not outline the frequency. It doesn't say every month, it doesn't say every year, it doesn't say every week. You can do communion every Sunday if you wanted to. As a matter of fact, if you go to Catholic Mass, that's what you're going to get. We can do communion on New Year's Eve. We can do communion at Christmas. We can do communion during Pentecost. We can do communion at 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock. We can do it once a month, once every three months, once every six months. I'm just trying to tell you, if you ain't following the theme here, that you don't have to pass out if you miss communion. And I'm saying this lightly here because I don't want to devalue the fact that you take it seriously because you should. I just want you to balance how serious you take it with with the understanding that if you miss a Sunday or something happens, it, it doesn't mean you don't love God. <laughs> Are you following along with this? We came up with that stuff. So he says, every time we do this, we're participating in the coming of Christ. And that's the last thing that he says. This means that not only are we thanking God for what he's brought us from, but then when we talk about the blood that never loses his power, we're talking about the fact that Jesus was crucified and died on the cross and that we expect him to return again. And so this says, God, I remember you. You ain't back yet, but I ain't forgot you. You know them spray painted t-shirts, gone but not forgotten. That, that's, that's what it is. Jesus, I know you're gone but not forgotten. And every time we do this, we're reminded that we have something greater to look forward to. So I'm thanking God for where he brought me from. I'm meeting my family at the table and thanking God that I'm part of the family. And then I leave in the expectation that I know God is going to return and I know there's something greater on the other side of all this nonsense that we're dealing with. Does that help you understand <laughs> Now, I'll tell you this. I grew up in a church that took communion serious. There was no talking during communion. There was no walking other than to get communion. There was no leaving the sanctuary until it was completely done. Because this was considered, and still is considered, the most sacred of sacraments in the church. This is the center of it. Now, need one last tidbit. Y'all gonna be like church scholars when y'all leave here. When you go to a Catholic church, where is the communion table? Right in front, right in the middle, right? And where is the lectern? On one side, and then there's usually a smaller lectern. Probably not the sides messed up. On the other side, right? Now, do y'all know why it's laid out like that? In the Catholic Church, communion representing the body of Christ is the centerpiece of the worship. That's why it's in the middle of the church. The preaching and spoken word are considered supplements to the body of Christ. We're Protestant, which means either you're Catholic or you're everybody else. If you're everybody else, you're Protestant. Either you're Catholic or you're everybody else. We're Protestant. For us, the Word of God is the central of our worship experience. Are y'all seeing this? Not that it devalues this because we still have this right out front, right? But we believe that when we gather in the worship experience, it's not just to come to experience God, but we also gather to hear from God. Right? Because we walk by faith, not by sight, and faith coming by and hearing by, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Y'all see the difference now? So that's why the community table you walk in Catholic church right in the middle. You walk in our churches right here. But all of this adds up to, I come here to experience God. I come here to thank God for what he's done. I come here to be reminded, every time you eat that little flat cracker, just remember when your life was flat, okay? Just remember when your life was flat. And then I come in anticipation of what God is going to do for me. Now, I'm going to walk you through the liturgy, and then I'm going to get out your way. Start the liturgy. Elin, slide. There you go.
Amen. All right. The solicitation, and I'm just going to mosey through this. You that do truly the urge to repent of your sins and are loving, cherish with your neighbor and attending the new life while calling call the commandments of God, walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make a confession. So notice what he's saying. You that truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and cherish with your neighbor. Did we just say that? Yes. Are in love and cherish with your neighbor. Don't be bringing your hateful self up here. Don't get yourself right. Don't bring your hateful self up here. But the solicitation is just that. It is the invitation for everybody to come. It is the door is now open. It is the open sign on the front of the store. It is everybody come. And then you get to the end, it says meekly bowing and kneeling. I'll tell you this. I grew up in a little country church where you had to get down on your knees and face the pew every time we pray. Anybody grew up in a church like that? Besides me, you get down on the floor right there and you turn around and you put your face in the little pew and pass it. Y'all church sport. That's what y'all are. <laughs> church sport. Y'all don't even know how good you got in church sport. Next slide. So this is the confession. What is the confession? It's saying, God, I, I know I'm not even supposed to be here. I'm not even worthy to come to the dinner. I don't know how I got Willy Wonka's gold chicken. I don't, know how, I don't know how I got invited to this dinner. I'm not worthy. You know I'm messed up, Lord. How dare you invite me to your dinner? Don't you love it that even Judas got to come eat with Jesus? Because we all kind of Judas in our own way, but that's a different subject. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge, I acknowledge, I admit it, I'm saying to you that the sins and wickedness that we be well means that I feel sad about them, most from time to time have committed, watch this, committed by thought, committed by word, and committed by deed. Now you might not have deeded it, and you might not have worded it, but you thought it didn't. <laughs> now, I thank God that he gives us a spirit of self-discipline. There's a whole lot of folk probably would have got the taste moving out their mouth if he didn't give us some self-discipline. Because like I said, you might not have needed it and you might not have worded it, but some of us showed up thought it, okay? So you have to confess that. Guys, sometimes the stuff I be thinking ain't always right. Your wrath and indignation against us, we do earnestly repent. Y'all know what that means? I'm heartily sorry. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. I feel bad that I could not do all I'm supposed to do. I'm trying to be better, Lord. Sorry, I said, Lord, God is not through with me yet, but I'm confessing, God. I know I'm coming up short. Somebody say, I know I'm coming up short. Next slide. Slide. Almighty God, who in your great mercy find us, forgive us and sin to all that with heart repentance, you pray eternal unto you. This first collect says, God, I admit I'm a sinner. And you promised me in your word that you would forgive me of my sins if I acknowledge you. So I'm saying to God, God, first, anybody who wants to come can come. Second, when we get here, God, I know I'm coming up short. But God, first collect, you said to me, that you are faithful and just and will cleanse me of all unrighteousness. First John chapter 1, verse 9. If I acknowledge my sins. Next slide. Slide. Second clip. Almighty God, from whom all hearts are known, all desires know, from whom no secrets are hid. Let me just pause there. This is all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. You might as well confess them. <laughs> you, you might have left out of people, you might have left out of people, you know, you come up short, you already know it. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Why do I have to cleanse my heart? Because God does not want dirt and sin in his table. So let's go back. Everybody's invited. God, I know I'm a sinner. You promised that you would cleanse me up if I acknowledge my sin. God, help me to have a clean heart. Help me to not be mad at people. Help me not to be bitter. Help me not to have... Help me not worry about all these negative things. Because let's be honest, church, that drain my energy and take away from the positive things I couldn't do. I was going to put it on my Facebook one day. I don't know how broke people got so much time for everything else. And what I meant by that is stuff 
you only have so much synergy and time and energy. And when you give it away to negativity and other things, you rob yourself of the chance. You rob yourself of the chance to do something positive with the energy that you need. You hear what I'm saying? All right, I'm waiting on the ushers to get done. Third clip. Prayer of adoration. What do y'all think this is? Just simply let God know we love So, I invite you to the table. God, I'm not worthy. God, you promise you cleanse me. God, give me a clean heart. Prayer of adoration. It is very meek, right, bound, and we should at all times give thanks to you, God. Therefore, we join the angels and our angels and all the company of heaven. Holy, holy, holy God, heaven and earth are full of your glory. That is simply just giving God praise for making all this happen. Next slide. Back. Prayer of humiliation. Now, this is an important one because this accompanies the, the first prayer, uh, confession of sins. Because along with the confession, it's supposed to come some sense of humility. This is why, and y'all can be mad at me if you want to, this is why I don't do the whole officers come get communion first. Because we eat. Everybody in here either trying to get in or hoping somebody get in and put in a good word for them. Y'all missed that down right over here. <laughs> We either trying to get to heaven or we already know we ain't going to make it. So we hope that when our grandma gets here, she's going to talk to Jesus on our behalf. Amen. Humility. I don't presume to come to this table trusting in our own righteousness and mercy. I know I'm not worthy to get the crumbs on the table. You're the same God who always has mercy, etc., etc. Let me wrap all this up and say, you should be thankful to be here today. That's the humility piece. Because being here ain't got nothing to do with how much money you got, what car you drive, where you live, how many degrees you got, how long your resume is, what your credit score is, what kind of belt purse you carry. There's people in the grave that have all of that 10 times what you got. But that ain't got that ain't adding up. But the songwriter said, morning by morning. New. I wish I had four day knees in here and didn't know that song. New mercies. So I come with the prayer of humiliation saying, God, I'm not worthy to be here, and I'm just thankful to be here. Next slide. This is the prayer of consecration. And we're almost there. And this is the whole moment that I'm trying to reach the right words. Spiritually transforms these elements in this moment into something more sacred. Almighty God, who to the mercy of Son, who suffered death on the cross, and then we'll keep going once off of the Lord's sacrifice. Keep going next time. We humbly beseech you and ask that you grant these to your creatures of bread and wine, and remembrance of the passion and death, and may be partakers of the most blessed body and blood. So we're asking God to allow us to participate in his death by this act of taking communion that comes out of originally the tradition of the Jews being set free. So just as they were set free from bondage from Egypt, we come celebrating that we are set free from the bondage of sin. And that is why we sing the blood will never lose its power. He was betrayed, he took the bread, he gave thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, hey, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this is the of me. Next slide, I think there's one. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave the same thing, drink all of it. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. So, there you go. We're going to have a cup.
fake guys out there in your house. Dirty enough guys out there. Dirty enough guys out there. We got trash cans. And when we bring up our offering, we can bring this up at the same time. I'm going to go ahead and open up a little. Unleavened. Your piece of unleavened bread. Don't y'all feel cool now? You don't all know what unleavened bread is. And the grape juice. I will say this uh, other caveat. You can you can use real wine. And, and like if this is done in church and other churches, they do use real wine, uh, but we don't do that because we don't want anybody who may be um, struggling in that area to have a challenge. So that's why we don't do it. I also need you to know that it doesn't have to be grape juice. So if your body cannot take grape juice, for whatever reason, just use water. Because the power is not in the substance. The power is in the experience and the reenactment of the mind of the suffering that Jesus shared with his disciples. So I don't want you to get so caught up that it has to be grape well, juice, well, just grape juice in a 16 ounce bottle from I-16 and Strack Van Teels on a Thursday. Like, it ain't, it ain't that serious. Okay? It's not in that juice. It's in the expression and what we're doing here. And the same thing with the bread. And a lot of times, because I don't want my members to be cut off guard, people will use regular bread. Okay? So if you go to, like, a United Methodist Church, I'm going to tell y'all, or a different church, and they got a big loaf of bread, I'm going to tell you what they're going to expect you to do. They expect you to take a piece and break it off the bread and then dip it in the body and then and then you know do the thing. I was laughing because I'm like, y'all trying to put Jesus back together. Amen. Like, <laughs> but anyway, it's all acceptable, and I just don't want the emphasis to be in the wrong place. The emphasis is in the experience and in the and in what we do to some of our guys. Everybody got your cracker? Come on, everybody say thank you, Jesus. We need your cracker. Thank you. Drink the blood, not only do we thank him for the blood that makes everlasting life possible, but if you remember from our lesson, we also drink this blood in anticipation of God's return to claim all of us. Somebody say, I can't wait. Come on, let's drink. That wasn't no drive by, was it, Jerry?
next slide. series next Sunday around the topic of prayer, encouraging all to invite family and friends for this series designed to help us all understand the basics. Next slide. The men's ministry is back in action. If you're sitting next to a brother, tell them you're talking to you. Talking to you. Talking to you. This Saturday at 9 a.m., the men will meet for Brothers Breakfast and Bible. All men are invited, so feel free to bring a brother along. They don't have to be a member of the church or any of that. They just need to be a brother with a Bible. And uh, we're going to have some good eggs and a few things. And that will be Saturday at 9 o'clock a.m. It's usually about 90 minutes, sometimes even a little quicker. So come on up, brothers. Let's get back together and bring some thick skin because you got to have thick skin to be around this group. Next slide. It's that time of year, and I am wondering, how does your lawn look? Well, if your grass is long and your yard looks sick, it's time to call the Gary Lawn Doctor, our own Colin McCullough. And you see the number on the screen we use him here at the church. He's amazing. And if you want a reasonable rate, I'll give your grass done. And I'm going to tell you why you should do it, because then when you leave town, your house still looks nice, right? Because you've got somebody already doing your grass. Lastly, yeah, save the date. Our car show scholarship program is August 27th, and I already got the Northwest Indiana Corvette Club ready to roll on that day. We're working on getting the ladies with the Dodge Chargers in here on that day. Some old schoolers and a few other things, tricks up my sleeve. We got the DJ lined up and I'm working on committees. So uh, you'll hear more as it gets closer. But I want you to mark down that Saturday. And we're going to put this scholarship plan together and send our baby out of here. Uh, get some scholarship help on her way to college. I think we got a woman. Uh, not Raven. Uh, Break in, right, right. Not Raven, Raven. Right yeah. She's our, unless we got another 12th grader. Y'all know we got to encourage these kids, so come on out. I know some of y'all got them secret uh, Ford focuses in your garage, sitting on 32s, painted pink with leather interior and Gucci headrest in there. Uh, I need you to bring them out, and we're going to get ready to have a good time. We'll have flyers for this when it's closer to you. So that's it. Yes. So I'm working on that. 
And if there happens to be that we can pull this off and we get city funds and there's still money left over, then the next thing it'll probably go towards is the church van. If there's anything remaining. But I ain't worried about the van right now. I'm worried about the building. If we could come out of this by removing that and being debt free off our mortgage, that would be pretty cool. Now, in my mind, that's 150 people giving a thousand dollars or 75 people giving two thousand or whatever. Now, I'm saying this today because I'm starting today. I, I haven't put a campaign, I don't have a banner, I don't have a cute slogan, I don't have all the marketing and branding that's going to go with it because I just pulled up to the church and saw the church fell down this morning. And God just put it on my heart, like, quit messing with the fanfare and just do what you need to do. Now, I'll tell you this. I'm going to start with the first thousand dollars. My wife is going to put a second thousand in that's mine and she's going to say it's hers. <laughs> I'm just kidding, y'all. I'm going to put the first thousand in. My wife will put the second thousand in. Here's the catch. Hear me close. We still ain't fully recovered from COVID. So you can't take what you've been given as a tithe and offering and then just move it over to the building. That doesn't do anything. It doesn't get us ahead. As a matter of fact, it puts us behind. Because now that you're committed to the mortgage, we try to honor what you asked. And now we're coming up short on an electric bill because you took what was normally ties and offerings and moved it over to mortgage. This has to be above and beyond what we normally do, okay? For those of you that are in doubt, if you ain't figured out yet, me and my wife are constantly in top 10 or top 5 givers in this church. I don't ever ask y'all to do something I don't do myself. We lead the way every time. Every time. So this ain't about... Me getting no new suits. My suits are only $99 at KMG. This is about us knocking this out. But what a wonderful Christmas we could have. If between now and I got 120 days, we could get all this done. We could burn the mortgage at Christmas. We could work on it because the next step they want to put either a storage thing for the food pantry or make a parking lot or something next door to the church. We're going to talk about that later. But right now, I feel like we're in a liable position because somebody could get hurt. So I don't know if the city's gonna come out more and take that side yet or what. And when I talk about a hole, it's bigger than that hole. Okay, when I say it fell in, you can go see it fell in. So I don't know what you prepared today. I figured I better say it close to tax return time. Before I start seeing all that car more license plates riding up and down the highway. <laughs> And I know everybody can't do a thousand, do whatever you can. You just write on your envelope, uh, mortgage. I mean, is that fine thought? If we just write mortgage and it just all go into one pile. Just write mortgage and we're going to know and we're going to move forward. If you can do more than that, bless you because somebody else can't and so you cover it for somebody else. But I believe 150000 is in reach and that's not a lot of debt to pay off a church because I was more than that in my house, let alone the whole church. So that's that. Okay? And be in prayer uh, that we get this done. And when you leave, you drive by it so y'all can see. I ain't just making this stuff up. Yeah. What'd you do, write it down? Casino. 
<laughs> you want to cheat your pastor out of the casino, y'all get to help me raise this. I thought I was going to have to give my other job back. Amen. Y'all want me to go back to my old job. Amen. Amen. So y'all, y'all come help me. Now this is, don't put that in there. What did she do with that? Who else did raise their hand? Whatever. Bring me one basket. This is going to be just for this morning. I'm going to just start it off today. If you're not ready today, I'm going to do this for 120 days. This is just for the morning. We're going to take up tithes and offerings in a minute. Because I need you to understand you can't overlap them. If we overlap them, it's not going to come out right. Here you go, thank you. Yeah, yeah, go back to the, the, the online giving. I think there's a mortgage already online. There's a, there's a thank you for bringing that up. That one word, right? Right there. No, yeah. There's a thing that says mortgage online. You can pay it online, credit card, whatever. So this is going to be the, the mortgage bucket, but I'm going to hold this. Everybody else, we want to put it in the mortgage bucket. You can bring it when we come around for offering. Come on, hold your offering up. God, we thank you for everything you give us, everything you trust us with, and everything you love us with. For the Bible says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There is nothing I have that doesn't already belong to you. But I thank you, God, that I had something today to give to you. Use it to thy glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 